Hello and behind me is our Lockheed F-104 Starfighter and this is the fourth video in my series on the Century Jets. Now this aircraft itself was a bit of a rejection of the ongoing idea whereby fighter aircraft were becoming increasingly more complex so this itself was especially light and small for the time hence why it was nicknamed a missile with a man. This wasn't actually used that much by the Americans but went on to be exported to many other allied countries around the world. In our first video we looked at the F-100 Super Sabre and its unique air intake located in the nose and the design reasons for that amongst other things. Then we looked at the F-101 Voodoo which was extremely fast and powerful, being the only Sentry jet with two engines. Next was the F-102 which was the first USAF jet with a delta wing and now we're looking at the fascinating F-104 Starfighter. This single seat air superiority fighter was initially designed as a day fighter but the role was later changed to an all weather multi-role aircraft. Starting at the nose we have the pitot tube kept well forward of the fuselage by this large boom, again the reason being that the air was thought to be compressed in front of the aircraft at very high speeds, therefore this kept that instrument well ahead of that to avoid any interference. Inside the nose cone was an ANASG-14 fire control system using a 24 inch radar antenna. It had a search range of around 20 miles but later models increased that to 40 miles although the actual target tracking mode had to be within around 10 miles. Of interest, it only worked on targets above 3000 feet as anything below that would be affected by the radar return from the ground. This is why aircraft would fly at very low altitudes to avoid radar contact. Moving on we have this single M61 rotary cannon located here on the port side and this was the first aircraft to carry this type of weapon. Here's an example of one in front of an F-15. It was fed by a 725 round drum behind the pilot's seat so that when it was firing at 6000 rounds per minute it would run out of bullets after only 7 seconds of continuous fire. During testing they found that exhaust gases from the firing built up within the compartment leading to an explosion so they had to bleed some air from the engine, blew it into that compartment to provide positive pressure to expel the gas outwards. On the topic of armament it had 7 hard points with a capacity of 4000 pounds and could carry missiles such as the AIM-9 Sidewinder or other bombs and rockets. Above here is the in-air refueling probe and what's interesting is that how it almost looks like it was stuck on the side of the fuselage as an afterthought and it highlights how little room there is within the fuselage for anything else. It reminds me of the temporary refueling system used on the F-102 to cross the Pacific Ocean to Vietnam. Moving further aft we come to the side mounted air intakes. It's lifted off the fuselage to avoid the slow and turbulent fuselage boundary layer and this here is a fixed inlet cone. There's no variable geometry inlets like the SR-71 or Concorde so at higher Mach numbers the excess air would bypass the engine inlets and move around it thus providing cooling to the engine. If you look closely you can see this which sucks out the boundary layer that has formed over the inlet cone, again keeping the airflow into the engine as smooth as possible. The cones itself would create shock waves inside the inlet which lowered the incoming air to subsonic speed just prior to ingestion by the engine. Now let's have a look at this fascinating wing. It's further aft along the fuselage than most aircraft wings and was incredibly thin. The idea was that this would reduce drag, thus allowing for the high speeds that they were targeting. The leading edge in fact was so thin that not only would it bruise a ground crew who headbutted it, but it would actually often cut and draw blood. Early on they learned to install protective coverings for when they were on the ground. The wings were trapezoidal which was and remains quite a novel design. They decided that it would be the best option to allow high speeds as well as create enough lift especially at high altitudes. The engineers certainly succeeded with their performance figures as it was the first production aircraft to achieve Mach 2 and the first to reach an altitude of 100,000 feet after taking off on its own power. Yes the X-15 reached high altitudes but remember that it was launched from a B-52 mothership. The F-104 also held the time to climb record. In fact in 1958 it was the first aircraft to simultaneously hold that record in addition to the airspeed and altitude records. 
Although, while the thin wing helped with the performance, it didn't leave any room inside to hold any fuel, hence why they used these wingtip mounted fuel tanks, which could also be removed and replaced with missiles, and in here they could hold up to a third of the aircraft's fuel. Remember that the fuselage wasn't especially large either, so fuel storage was a problem. A novel low speed lift device is the boundary layer control system which bleeds air from the engine and blows it over the leading edge flaps when they are extended, thus increasing lift. Now you can't see them here because the flaps are not extended, but here's a diagram and you can see that at point number 2 is where the bleed air would be released. The problem is though that the pilots would have to keep the throttle up to maintain this lift, but also slow enough to actually land, thus adding to the complexity and higher speeds of the landing process. Moving further aft, you have this bright red hook, and this was designed to capture cables that could be used on ground-based runways. In an emergency, and to avoid the aircraft having an excursion and potentially crashing, this could be used to catch a cable. There were no plans to use this on an aircraft carrier. Moving down here is the main landing gear. Now because the wing is so thin, there was no room for the gear inside it, therefore it had to fold out from the main fuselage. But because that would create an extremely narrow and unstable track for an aircraft that already had a very high takeoff and landing speed, the strut had to be angled outwards. For comparison's sake, here's the main landing gear on an F-102 which folds up into a much thicker wing and is directly angled downwards. An interesting fact is that when NATO countries purchased these, they needed reinforced landing gears and larger tyres that they could operate on rougher tracks and potentially even grass. The problem was that there were already the absolute minimum excess room in the fuselage, so they actually had to install a bulge in the wall to allow the larger tyres to fit in. We'll move our way back and look at the outlet for the single General Electric J79 turbojet, and if you look closely you can make out the after burning device where the fuel is pumped out and ignites producing 15,600 pounds of thrust, pushing it to a top speed of Mach 2.2. Here's a photo of one sitting next to the YF-104A prototype, and it demonstrates how much of the fuselage was just the engine. It was a solid engine, and four of these J79s were used in the B-58 Hustler, and two of them in the F-4 Phantom II. Looking up, we have the T-tail. The horizontal stabiliser was moved up to the top of the vertical fin, which keeps the fuselage smooth and aerodynamic. It's up above the disturbed air behind the wings, and there were also concerns with early jets that uncontained engine failures could destroy this mechanism if it was right next to the engine, thus increasing the likelihood that the aircraft would then become uncontrollable. So it was kept up away from the engine to avoid that risk. But a disadvantage was that during high angles of attack, airflow could be blocked by the fuselage and wings, thus causing it to pitch up further and spin. To manage the problem, there was a stick shaker installed that would alert the pilot that they were pulling back too hard and physically move the stick forward. But there were also instances where this pitch down system kicked in erroneously, which would obviously be very dangerous at low altitudes, so crews were actually encouraged to turn it off. There was also a drag chute behind for high speed landings. We'll move forward and underneath the massive wing of this B-57. We'll have a look inside the cockpit for this single pilot. And while most of them did have single pilots, there were two seat variants such as this F-104B built for several export countries to use as trainers. Early models had a downward firing ejection seat due to concerns about clearing the T-tail if it was fired upwards. This obviously raised serious questions about low altitude ejections. In fact, the flight manual suggested pilots roll the aircraft at low altitudes and eject when the aircraft was upside down, which doesn't seem overly realistic. Eventually, they were replaced with upward firing seats as technology improved. Another consideration was the potential high speeds of an ejection, and the shoes were connected to cables, and there were nets around the sides of the seat that would wrap the pilot up to ensure that the limbs wouldn't flail about and breaking bones after the ejection, and the shoes would be brought in tightly to the seat by those cables. The F-104 wasn't that popular in North America. Its safety record and limited armaments held it back and the US Air Force dramatically reduced their orders, although it did serve in Vietnam. It went on to be used and even built under license in allied countries, including Japan, Spain, and Canada. 
The Luftwaffe used theirs up until 1991, and the Italians were the last to retire theirs in 2004, although there are still some flying today, for research and enthusiast purposes. The Starfighter was also used by NASA in a research and development role. This F-104G model was fitted with a centerline pylon, and if you look closely, you can actually see the heat-resistant tiles that went on to be used on the space shuttle undergoing testing here. That pylon could also be used for additional fuel tanks, missiles, and even a nuclear bomb. The Starfighter took part in the ZLL tests, which stood for the Zero Length Launch System. Like the F-100, they attached a rocket to the underside, allowing it to take off without a runway and almost instantaneously. And then at higher altitude, the rocket would then just be dropped. Another version, the NF-104A, was modified to include a rocket dyne rocket engine that could push it up to 120,000 feet in altitude, where it was then used for research purposes. Because the air was so thin at that altitude, the control surfaces would then become useless, therefore it was fitted with a reaction control system, like what we saw with the Space Shuttle and X-15, and these had 12 thrusters using hydrogen peroxide to control what was, sort of, now a spaceship. Here is Chuck Yeager in one, and Neil Armstrong also flew these. Now the F-104 did have a very poor safety record, in fact the German public called it the Widowmaker as they lost 292 of the 916 delivered in total, and 116 pilots. Out of all the Sentry jets, this had the highest loss rate, although the most famous loss was in 1966 when one was involved in an in-air collision with the XB-70, destroying both aircraft, killing two and seriously injuring another. But it is a fascinating aircraft, and while it certainly had flaws, it's an incredible piece of engineering that has contributed significantly to the development of other aircraft. Incredibly, the contract was signed, and it first flew all within a single year. What really stood out to me seeing it in the metal was how small it is. Other Sentry jets, such as the F-101 and 105, were properly big aircraft, while this really was a missile with a man stuck on the top. Thanks for watching the Century series of videos, and please give it a thumbs up as it really helps promote the video and helps me avoid including product placements that I'm paid to say are amazing. And don't forget to check out my earlier videos, and coming up next will be my tour around the F-105 Thunderchief. Thanks again.